All right, welcome to uh, basically the rest of Spain uh, theory webinar. Um, we've covered already Rioja and Navarra. We've covered uh, Catalonia. We've covered um, Sherry from Andalusia and our fortified wine presentation, as well as some of the dry wines from Andalusia. So that leaves us with the remaining um, autonomias of Spain and all of the DOs that sit within them. Today, uh, we're gonna pay attention um, to all of those. We'll take a look at each of them individually, uh, but of course, with special attention to Galicia, uh, the País Vasco, and Castilla León. Perhaps the, the northern side, really the, the more quality focused wine regions within Spain. Um, there's not a ton of slides, but there's a lot to unpack within each one of the slides. So um, it's probably gonna take us about a half hour or so. All right, let's get fired up with Galicia. We start with Rias Baixas. Um, you can see here on the far west coast, just north of Portugal and right on the northern uh, edge of the Mino River. Rias Baixas uh, translates to low estuaries. And for those of you that are Guild Song members, uh, there's a fantastic webinar given by uh, Master Sommelier David Yoshida last week. It's a couple hours long, a little bit longer than some of mine typically because he's tasting with producers, but there's a ton of historical information. We're not going to focus as much on history uh, with this presentation today. I feel like we've given a lot of history lessons in the other Spanish presentations. So we're going to just kind of give you the nuts and bolts here. Um, in Rias Baixas, uh, it's about 90% Albarino uh, planted. You'll also find, though, Caino, a local red, especially, especially Espadero and Mencia. Uh, if you label varietal es, uh, Albarino, excuse me, just as Rias Baixas, it has to be 100%. If you're utilizing a subzone, it has to be 70%. Uh, the local decomposed granite is called Chabre. There's a ton of rainfall. Uh, but a lot of that happens during the vine dormancy. So it's very humid and it makes uh, Albarino's thick skins important to avoid mildew. Uh, there are five subzones that you should know about. Um, we'll start here in the, the western north portion with Val de Salinas. This is the largest with about half of the overall acreage. It's also, as you can tell, the what is the coolest being right on the coastline. You also have uh, Ribera de Ula right here. Um, you've got Ol Rosal, down here in the southwest. Condado de Tea, right here, uh, is the warmest and the driest. As you can see, it's the furthest inland. Uh, and then you've got Sutomayor here in the center, although Sutomayor may not label as a subzone. So you won't find any subzone labeled Sutomayor like you might with Val de Salnes or Condado de Tea. Uh, today, you still find the Parral system in place, although a lot of the vineyard um, Vineyard sites are getting away from it, but it's utilized to uh, lift the grape vines up off of the ground so that they can plant other crops underneath it. Also, it helps to provide more canopy to the grapes to avoid any type of sun burning um, that you might get to. Uh, also within Galicia, you'll find Ribero just here east of Condado de Utea, sub, uh, sub zone of Rias Baixas. This Area is known for Trechadura and Caino. Um, it's also famous for vino, to, uh, vino Tostado, which is a dry grape wine, fairly similar to what you find with Vinsanto in Tuscany. Um, and here these have to get to a minimum of 350 grams per liter of musk weight. Uh, further inland, you'll find Valioras, which translates to the Valley of Gold. Uh, mostly here, you're gonna find Godeo, uh, but you also have reds and vino tostado permitted. Um, varied soils, but there is a lot of slate that's quite important, especially for Godeo. Uh, Ribera Sacra translates to the sacred bank. And of course, these are uh, all within uh, the conquest of uh, Santiago de Compostela, Compostela excuse me, uh, where people make that famous religious walk. Um, so you see a lot of monasteries in the area. Uh, Ribera Sacra is known for Menthia, Godeo, and Trechadura. Um, it has a handful of subzones itself. You can see here Chantada, Riberas du Mino, which is, of course, follows the Mino, uh, Riberas du Sil, Amandi, and Quiroga Bebe, which is probably my favorite to say. <laughs> uh, this sits right on the Sil River, and we'll talk about that more as we follow uh, into Castilla and Leon in just a minute. 
There's another labeling term in Rivera Soccer that's allowed called sumum, which indicates a minimum of 85% of your principal varieties um, with 60% menthea or 100% of the principal grapes for whites. Uh, and then you'll also find Monterey here in Galicia, uh, most famous for white wines uh, from Guadeo. This is the Tamega River that comes right off. So a lot of different little small rivers that break out through Rias Baixas. Uh, of course, the Sill and the Mino are critical. And then, and then you find the Tamega. Uh, we shift further north here and go to Basque country, the like Pais Basco, um, famous now for what is known as chocolate or farm wine. Um, in addition to that, you'll find San Sebastian right here, this beautiful little fishing town um, that I highly recommend you all visit if you get the opportunity to. Um, some of the best pinchos in the area, wonderful seafood, and uh, it's just a beautiful area to walk through. Uh, three areas that are broken down here, the Guitariaco Chacolina, uh, Biscaico, and then Arabaco. Um, and then Biscayo, Ico, and Guitariaco are known more for being quality um, as they're closer to the ocean. They're also a little bit more difficult to maintain vineyard sites because of that. Uh, it's a little more marginal. Uh, but the Ar Arabaco is a lot less vineyard growing today, although historically it was more famous. The grapes here, of course, are Andarabi Zuri for whites and Andarabi Belza for reds. And then you can use both for the rosé, locally known as Ojo de Gallo. It's also important to note that Rioja Alta is technically in the Basque country too. Um, as we move to Castilla Leon, um, we find ourselves, you can see here in the northwest portion, uh, really Galicia is here and then Pais Vasco, just kind of north of it, right up there. So now this big swath of land right here. Uh, we're going to really focus on three major regions. Um, well, four. Bierzo here in the northwest. Uh, you'll find Roberto Duero. We're going to obviously need to talk about that. Rueda and then Toro. Uh, we start in Bierzo, uh, mainly for Menthea. Uh, minimum 70% for red and 50% for rosados. You'll also find Cabello, Doña Blanca, and Palomino for whites. This was a heavy mining area for coal and iron. It's protected from the Atlantic Ocean uh, by the Sierra de los Encaras. And of course, it sits on that Sil River Valley, a continuation of um, that Ribera Sacra uh, subzone, Ribera de Sil that we talked about. We'll start to really discuss elevation as we get into what's known as the Meseta Central here. Um, so in Bierto, you'll find anywhere from 450 to 800 meters above sea level. Uh, with two official subzones, excuse me, unofficial, uh, the Bayo Bierzo and the Alto Bierzo. Of course, we see that all throughout Spain, uh, Baja and Alto. Here you'll find a lot of quartz and slate soils. And important to note too, that in 2017, the Vino de Parache was established. Um, this is in a hierarchy of labeling. You can see you would label as Vino de la Region, which is Bierzo. Uh, if you want to do a village wine or Vino de Vila, uh, you can also do Vino de Parache. Vino de Vin Classificada, which is sort of a crew, and then Gran Vino de Vigne Classificada, which is basically Grand Cru for Bierzo. I would be looking for things like Montreal uh, Vineyard to, to be labeling as, as that, which is, of course, Descendientes de J. Palacios. Um, Raul Perez, of course, is critical in the region, and he sort of opened the door for Alvaro Palacios and others to come in. Uh, Rueda, you could see much further south and inland than what we were in Bierzo. Uh, Verdejo really was res resurrected here by Marcus de Riscal in the 1970s. Um, white wines labeled as Rueda require 50% Verdejo, um, although as of the 2019 vintage, they may be 50% Verdejo or Sauvignon Blanc plus Chardonnay and Viognier. I just want to, you know, make note that when these law changes occur, uh, it's something you have to take in stride. And I think in a region like Rueda, you know, we used to know varietal Sauvignon Blanc and Verdejo required 85%. That was removed for the 2019 vintage. I would keep that around as a note card just until you feel like those wines have gone away because there's probably still some 2018 Rueda out there um, that you never know. If a guest asks about it, you might want to just keep yourself abreast of the situation being 85% Sauvignon Blanc and Verdejo. Uh, your reds and rosados here require a minimum 50% Tempranillo. Uh, you can also make sparkling wine in addition to the rosés and whites and reds. 
although they're pretty difficult to find outside of the EU. Um, Brut and Brut Nature for those sparkling wines require 85% for Dejo. And then a, a local traditional style known as Dorado for dry fortified wines. It's basically extinct. I did get to try it. A few of you maybe at Texan have gotten to try it too. Um, the name translates to golden and these were commonly affected by floor and had very expressed Roncio notes. Uh, today, there's a, a, a style known as Polito uh, that is also floor protected and fortified that's been recently recognized. Uh, again, we're looking at higher elevations, six to 700 meters above sea level. Uh, you'll find limestone and gravel soil types, and it, this is where you start to find the most extreme continental climates in all of Spain. I mean, you can see this is basically dead center in the country, and now we're starting to think of those really, really hot brown soils, right? Uh, for your sparkling wines, they do have Gran Añada, uh, which is 36 month plus Surly. And then you'll also find uh, wines labeled as Gran Vino de Rueda that uh, are 30 year old vines or older. Ribera del Duero, as we get a little further east within Castilla y Leon, um, this surrounds two major cities around the Duero here and then Peñafiel here. Uh, it's broken down into uh, four major provinces from the west to the east. You'll find Valladolid, uh, Burgos here, uh, Segovia, and then Soria. And this, again, extreme continental climate. It gets hot. Uh, Don Eloy Lecande y Chavez famously founded Vega Cecilia here in 1864, though it wasn't until Domingo Chomin took over as the winemaker and achieved claim uh, at the World Fair um, in 1917 and 1918 with his Unico wine. It was labeled as Vino de Mesa um, and still is and, and aged for as long as a decade in French and American oak barrels. Uh, you'll also find Cascara um, from Fernandez. You'll find Dominio de Pingas, Aalto, and Protos, which was once Vega's co-op. They're some of the most famous and sought after wines in all of Spain, to be honest with you. You'll find reds and a small amounts of rosados, although again, updated in 2019, you can include whites from a minimum 75% albio mayor. Um, previously, albio mayor was allowed to be blended into red wines for quite a long time. Um, the grapes here, Tempranillo, locally known as Tinto Pais and elsewhere sometimes known as Tinto Fino, uh, plus Garnacha, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and again, albio. Uh, you can see too, I put the labeling requirements as they're slightly different than traditional Spanish wines. Uh, Criantha for reds uh, would be 24 months with 12 in oak, whites and rosés 18 and 6. For reserva, you step up to 36 months with 12 in oak, 24 and 6 for white and rosé. And then for Grand Reserva, you go to 60 months with 24 in oak. And again, white and rosé, four years uh, with six months in oak. Other DOs of the Castilla Leon. Uh, Autonomia. Uh, you'll find Arlantha for Tempranillo, Garnacha, and Albio Mayor. It's named for the Arlantha River. Uh, we can actually dive in here and take a quick little look just to show you where these guys are. Um, as you can see, we had Bierzo up here. We'll take a look at Diero, uh, Tierra de Leon. Here's Arlantha, just north of Roberto del Duero. Here's Rioja up here. Um, we'll also take a look at CLS in just a second. Uh, Tierra del Vino de Zamora, um, Toro, Sabreros, Arribes, and I think we're going to really talk about Vino de Calidad, Sierra de Salamanca. We'll really see a lot of that. Uh, CLS, probably most famously known for rosados originally and claretas, uh, which are a deeper hued style of rosado. Um, you'll find this on the uh, Piserga River. Um, from seven to 800 meters above sea level with limestone and, and pretty interestingly enough, Galet Roule, which are uh, exactly the same as the Galet that you would find in Chef Duf du Pot. Tierra de Leon, again, high elevation. Uh, Prieto Picudo is a pretty cool indigenous red there, but don't see a lot of them outside of Spain. Uh, Toro, maybe the most famous right on the outside of Rueda, just west of it, right? So here's Rueda and the Toro is right here. Uh, Vega Cecilia's Pintia came online there in the 1980s. Um, it is, again, high elevation, continental, cold nights, varied soils with 75% Tempranillo in the area. 
Um, the other famous one would be Numantia, founded in 1998, although it was sold to Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy in 2008. This is a member of the Grandes Pagos de España, uh, which is a voluntary association not to be uh, confused with Vino de Pago. Grandes Pagos de España is a little more political driven, I would say, than, than Dio Pago. Of course, you have the Vino de la Tierra, um, Tempranillo dominant, high elevation, and then Arabesh, we mentioned. Uh, they do have pretty interesting indigenous reds here, Brunyal and Juan Garcia, but a lot of these you don't see outside of the states other than Toro, or excuse me, inside of the states. Um, Aragon, you can see we shift a little further east within the country of Spain. This is sort of in between Catalonia and uh, the Basque country. Um, and most important though, I think of the DOs here, Campo de Borja, Calatayud and Carinana, and less so probably Somontano. Somontano is, is pretty um, separated and very different than the others. These three are fairly similar. Uh, this was first declared its own kingdom in 1035. There was a monarchical marriage uh, that raised its political prowess in 1469, helping develop export markets for their wines. Uh, Phylloxera, though, though, destroyed the demand for their styles in favor of more modern regions. Um, although there's been a resurgence and sort of a modernization to a handful of these. Calatayud is the largest. It's split by the Jalon River. Uh, it has a very arid climate. Again, vineyards, high elevation, not quite as high as the Maceta Central to the west. Uh, Garnacha is two thirds of the planted land and 92% planted to red, though you can basically produce all styles. You can also find a couple of uh, labeling terms here. Vinas Viejas must be 35 years old. And then if you label as Calatayud Superior, uh, you have to be 85% Garnacha and 50 year old vines. Um, Carinena, this little yellow area just east of Calatayud, uh, sits on the Huerva River. It was established in 1932. That, that predates um, any of the French AOCs. Um, all styles are permitted here, although it's Garnacha and Tempranillo, basically. Uh, Carignan, of course, famously uh, has its name from here, and while it's still utilized, it's best uh, produced in other areas. Uh, Campo de Borja, some of you may be familiar with because of producers like Alto Moncayo. Um, the namesake here is Alfonso de Borgia, which was an Italian uh, that was named Pope in 1455. Um, it's into the foothills of the Moncayo Massif, uh, which, strangely enough, you get that name Alto Moncayo from that. Um, three quarters of the land here is planted to Garnacha, uh, though there's plenty of different styles that are permitted. I also wanted to point out sort of the capital of the Autonomia is Zaragoza right here. Um, then as you get further east and Somontano, uh, this translates to in the footsteps of the hills or the mountain. Uh, you'll find less arid area with increased rainfall and more well-drained soils. Um, it's not quite as much Garnacha. You'll find actually Gewürztraminer, Riesling, Chardonnay, Cabernet, and Merlot succeed quite well. I know when I was in uh, Barcelona in January, we drank a handful of Somatano whites uh, that aren't varietally labeled. They're just white field blends that were quite interesting. Uh, although you'll also find indigenous varieties here, Alcanyon, Paralata, and Moristel. And of course, several different styles are allowed. Uh, Valencia, to the south and east of where we were in Aragon and just south of Catalonia. Um, the northern tip is known as Alto Turio, sits at a higher elevation here. Uh, this is 700 to 1100 meters above sea level and focuses on white wines, Merceguera, and Macabeo. You can see the Valencia Dio is split into two. Uh, it's really three, technically. Uh, the region of Moscatel focuses on sweet uh, mistellas and fortified wines, and then that southernmost area, known as uh, Clarion, can produce solid reds from Garnacha, and then a few other uh, local Spanish reds. Alicante, this green area down here, again split, um, is of course dominated by Monastrell, 75% um, of the hectareage here. Uh, there was a 1510 decree by King Ferdinand that forbode wine imports that elevated its own status locally and it lasted until 1834. It's got eight distinct subregions, and of course it's non-continuous, uh, but most of the wineries are in the Vinolopo 
inland uh, subregion. Uh, La Marina is the most important coastal subregion. And then two of them, El Comtat and, La and La Coya, are mountainous, can reach up to 1,500 meters above sea level. Uh, one thing to note, a uh, local specialty known as Fondion uh, is produced here from overripe monastrel grapes. I think Utiel Requena, uh, you can see just here around the city of Requena, mostly Bobal. Uh, Murthia, as we get uh, further south from Valencia, has three DOs, Eucla, Yekla, Humia, and Bulas. Of course, most famous probably though is Humia, for those of you that have seen um, any of the El Nido wines, right? Uh, Yekla, monastrol dominant, just like Humia is. Humia has got a little sandier soil above limestone. Um, Phylloxera did not arrive here until 1980. Of course, monastrel is critical, but you'll see indigenous, excuse me, international varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon too. Um, Bulosh, this huge area here, monastrel based. Um, there's a hand, three subzones here, northeast, central, and western. The central plateau, um, we'll take a look now at um, the Castilla-La Mancha and the Vinos de Madrid. Let's just zoom in real quick. You can see Madrid here, and then this big, massive area known as Castilla-La Mancha. A lot of bulk wine that comes out of here, okay? Uh, Vinos de Madrid, you can get as close to 11 kilometers from the city proper with these. Um, there's four subzones. Uh, the largest is Arganda. We'll also find Nabo Carnero, San Martin de Valde Iglesias, and El Moyar. Um, Abiel y Garnachos de Gredos organization poses some stricter rules than the regular appellation requires. And then you'll find uh, Sobre Madre wines, which are essentially orange wines. They allow for skin contact. Um, Castilla Mancha, Mancha means parched earth in Moorish. Um, here is where you will find the home of Manchego cheese, and there's a lot of sheep farming. The La Mancha Dio itself has 160,000 hectare under vine. That's massive. Um, and in fact, Almansa, Mentrida, and Ribera del Jucar were once subzones of La Mancha that were broken out later on. Um, you'll find a lot of the Marco Real system, which is head trained vines with two and a half meter spacing to limit any water competition between the vines because it's so dry and hot. Uh, Tempranillo here is known as Sensebel. Uh, you'll also find in, and we'll talk about this as we get to uh, Mallorca, You'll find it known as Bull de Yebre out here. We talked about Tinto Fino and Tinto Ruiz. And then in Portugal, which we did, um, I think last week, you'll find it known as Aragonesh. Um, the Ribera del Jucar uh, DO is Tempranillo plus Syrah and Bordeaux varieties with Sauvignon Blanc and Muscatel de Gran Menudo for whites. Uh, Manchuela, which is here. Okay, and you see Ribera del Jucar just, just west of it. Uh, is Bobal dominant. So this plays off the Utiel Requena that's right next to it. it. Sits between Bucar and the Cabriel rivers. You'll find a little bit of Macabeo too. Uh, Almansa just south of there is semi-arid with limestone. Again, high elevation. Monastrel, your sort of typical suspects here. Um, Val de Peñas is further south. Um, it's Tempranillo and used to have quite a bit of Iren. Uh, Mentrida is known for a history of bulk Garnacha. So the quality is sort of coming around. Here you'll find uh, the Gredos Mountains. Uh, Uclesh is Sierra de Altamira as the mountain right next to it. Uh, some of the areas here uh, in the west are over a thousand meters above sea level. Again, Tempranillo and Bordeaux varieties. We're starting to see a little bit of a, a theme here, aren't we? And then Mandehar sits on the Tagus River. Um, for Tempranillo, Macabeo, Sauvignon Blanc, Malvar, and Torrantes, not to be confused with the Torrantes from Argentina. Uh, Extremadura, to the far west, just before we get into Portugal, is known for one DO, and that's Ribera del Guardiana, because it sits on the Guardiana River. Um, here you'll find Hamon Serrano from Black Legged Pigs. Um, this is most of Spain's cork production here, and the name translates to the extreme limit of the land beyond the Duero. Um, so you can tell it's hot and crazy, right? There's a handful of subzones here. Uh, the Tierra de Barros is the largest. You can pretty much make all styles and most classic Spanish and Portuguese varieties are allowed here. 
Um, as we get off the mainland, uh, there's two sets of islands that are important to look at in Spain. The Balearic Islands um, are just off the east coast. Um, if you look just east of, say, Valencia and Alicante, um, you'll find these in the Western Mediterranean. There are four islands here. Famously, Ibiza, right, the, the party island, uh, Formentera, Mallorca, and Menorca. This is a pretty cheap little flight if you're in, say, uh, Barcelona um, to hop over for just a day. It's, it's super fun. Uh, Bini Salem and Pra y Yavant are the two DOs. You can see those here. The little small blue area is Bini Salem, and then the green area is Pra y Yavant, and those are both on Mallorca. Uh, Bini Salem was established in 1991 and is home to Harrius de Ribas, which was founded in 1711 easily the large, longest lived winery in the area. Um, you'll also find on this the Serra de Tramontana mountain. Um, you'll find classic Spanish varieties plus some indigenous grapes. Um, the Montenegro at 50% of the reds and then Mole, otherwise known as Prince Salt Blanc for half of the whites. Playa Javant uh, is French varieties plus Montenegro and Mole and then the indigenous variety of Foganal which I have actually seen on the label one time. And then we find the Canary Islands. Um, you could see, let me zoom in here for you all, that it's uh, pretty far off the coast. It's actually a lot closer to Morocco. It's only like 100, uh, 100 kilometers west of Morocco. So these became important stops for trade ships between Africa and Europe after the French conquered the island in 1402 and winemaking took hold. Um, Winemaking here occurs beyond the 28th parallel, and thus elevation plays a critical role as some of the vineyards sit at 1,500 meters above sea level or even higher. These are the highest um, out, uh, vineyard spots in elevation when it comes to the entire EU. You'll find a ton of volcanic soils throughout as there's a bunch of still active volcanoes. Uh, Fuerteventura here is the only island that doesn't have a DO. The other ones all have their own DO. And then the biggest one, Tenerife, is home to five. Uh, Liston Blanco is fresh and complex here, where it is actually rather lifeless elsewhere. Um, this is the Palomino grape that's famous from Spain's uh, sherry. Uh, you find also several variants of Malvasia uh, that are successful, as well as Albio Real, Gual, which is known as Gual in Madeira, Verdello, uh, Forastera Blanca, and Villariego Blanco for whites and sparkling. Liston Negro, uh, unrelated to Prieto, which is also known as Pais, also known as Mission, also known as Criola Chica, right? Uh, Negro Mall, which is Tinta Negra, Bastardo, which is Truso, Oboso Negro, uh, Vijariegro Negro, and Castela Negra. Uh, we mentioned Tenerife having five DOs. This is the most important, I would say, island uh, when it comes to the Canary Islands. Uh, it's the largest. Here, the mountain is known, or the volcano is called Mount Tady, and it sits at 3,700 meters above sea level. It's huge, right? And so this giant volcano actually acts as a little bit of a rain shadow, as rain patterns below from the north to the south, it makes the southern foothills uh, very arid. So you have very small vineyard plots here, and they're known as suertes, right? Uh, so most people just buy from a collection of grape growers. Um, on the northern portion, you've got three DOs. Um, you've got uh, Tacarante Asentejo, which is this gray area here. Um, you've got Valle de Orastava, which is this pale, pale beige area. And then you've got Icodin Daute Isora, which is this darker brown area. And then on the southern portion of the island, you've got the Valle de Guimar um, and then Abona. So the Tacarante Asentejo is the oldest and the largest, it's heavily planted to reds and almost a thousand. Um, meters above sea level for the vineyard sites. Baja de Oratava um, gets to be a little less elevation, but here you'll find the famous Trenzado or cordon trellising system. Let me zoom in on this real quick just so everybody can take a look. This is Trenzado. So what they'll do is they'll braid grape vines together and during their dormancy what they can do is move those aside and they can plant other crops in between them. And then whenever it's time for them to restart the life cycle of a grapevine. They'll use these little sticks to prop them up. It's pretty cool. 
Um, e coated Delta e Sora is about 70% based on Blanco and gets up to 1,000 meters above sea level. Um, on the southern portion, that big area of Bona, these are where Europe's highest vineyards are. It's mostly white uh, with least on Blanco and there's a little bit of least on Negro. And then Valle de Guimar, much drier here, um, gets up to 1,400 meters above sea level. And again, list on Blanco is the dominant planting. Lanzarote, uh, this island to the far northeast of the archipelago, um, is perhaps the most obscure wine growing region out there. Um, you can see already a couple of pictures here that, are, that showcase the, um, the difficulties that they have to go through in order to get grapes to grow. This is from Kelly White on Guildsom. Um, this is known as an Oyo. Uh, this is a shallow basin, about 10 by 5 meters for vine cultivation that protects the vines from super hot and humid winds. Uh, it's most commonly found in the Ligaria subzone of uh, Lanzarote. And then this soil type, this black volcanic here is called Sinitsa. And it's derived from a six year long eruption that started in the 1730s, which really kicked off viticultural production in the area. Today, there are still 30 plus active volcanoes. Um, the other thing that you might want to take a look at here is what's known as Zanyas. Um, so in areas that aren't La Guerrilla, there's a couple of others. Um, instead of using uh, the hoyos, they'll use these trenches that are built around each one of the vines, which are known as Zanyas. Super cool that they're actually producing grapes here, <laughs> but basically nothing else grows in this area. The rest of your Canary Island DOs, um, El Hierro was, uh, it's right here, I should point out, once famous for their dessert wines, La Palma's vineyard history dates back to 1505. Um, the last eruption in La Palma for volcanoes was in 1971. It's got three subzones, Juan Caliente, Hoyo de Maza, and Norte de La Palma. They're also famous for making Vino de Tea, which is a Roncio-style Roncio um, wine that's aged in 500 liter casks. And they do get some botrytized styles. Uh, La Gomera is here, very little viticultural output. And then Gran Canaria is the last established in 2005. That's my show for the rest of Spain. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, take it, study it, try to find some Canary Island wines to drink with it. Um, and hit me up with any questions you might have. We'll see you guys next week for Spirits. Cheers. <laughs>